everyone, I'm Stu. And I'm David. And I'm Patrick Kilpatrick. And this, this is, is the Bruce Brothers, Brothers Show. So we're here today with Patrick Kilpatrick. He is a actor, writer, producer. Mm -hmm. um, he's a man of all talents. And we're going to talk to him, so stay tuned. Well, look at what we got today. Oh my God. Oh my God. We haven't covered any food here for a while. It's been a while, and, and as you guys know, we uh, have covered and sampled quite a bit of food, as well as the coffee here at Bardona, and it is fantastic. And Steal my word, man. What? Fantastic. Fantastic. I it's say it all the time. I was watching one of our recent shows, and I was like, I really say, it. You say fantastic a lot. A lot. <laughs> So, um, you got the menu. Why don't I do. you read off to everybody? Yeah, what I don't want to miss anything. So, this is the ahi tuna bowl, mm -hmm. and it consists of ahi tuna, brown rice, sushi grade, this is sushi grade tuna, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, avocado, green onion, seaweed, flying fish roe, and citrus. Flying fish? Yeah. Oh. yeah. How do they, they catch that in a net or on a, like... Have you ever yeah. seen them? Fly, oh, I've seen, like, they fly out, they of, do, out yeah. of the water and stuff like that. That's fish eggs. Fish That's eggs, all it yeah. is, fish eggs. Nice. And, and then this is the new fried egg sandwich, mm. which obviously yeah. has fried eggs. Fried eggs. Um, but it some... also has bacon jam. Bacon, bacon jam. jam. I don't know what that means, but that... it's bacon. So, <laughs> it's good. good that. <laughs> Avocado, arugula, balsamic, and uh, on really rustic country bread, which I can't eat, but you can. I can eat the bread. You eat the bread. So we're gonna let's give it a try. Let's see what let's see what we got going on here. Wow. Why do we love our jobs? <laughs> um, yeah, they don't. Pay, it doesn't pay very well, but but, you know, it, but it we get fed once in, once in a while. Every once in a while, somebody puts something in our face. This is how we get sponsors, people. Sponsor us. And by the way, if you'd out. like us to come out to your restaurant or your business, uh, we'd love to hear about what you do. And then we'll come out and we'll talk about it. And you can tell us all about how you got started, and mm -hmm. where you came from, and where you're going. And we'll so I, by the way, I love this the seaweed stuff. It's, yes. I, I could just eat a pile good. of that. Um, so I, oh, you want to I'm going to go buy everything. So okay. we'll get, get that. Oh, doesn't that look good? It does look good. And here it goes. Mm. Nice job. Citrusy, nice, light, avocados, really, really fresh, and it's just ripe enough. The tuna is fantastic. Mm. <laughs> fantastic. Uh, fantastic. Uh, it doesn't have, um, it's got a little citrusy, smoky thing going on as well. Mm -hmm. So that's not spicy, anything? No, not spicy. All right, so now I got. We got the fork full the of perfect stuff. bite. Hmm. Did you watch Andrew Zimmer? Hmm. Mm -hmm. I was really happy that when we 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 were recently up the street at uh, Tacos to Madre, mm -hmm. and we we uh, were having some tacos there mm. and and talking about them. But what I enjoyed is that we didn't sound like Andrew Zimmer. Yeah. Have you ever noticed how closely they mic his mouth? No. What? I don't, it's been a while since I've seen oh, that. Oh, you can literally hear every mm -hmm. every mm -hmm. slosh mm -hmm. of saliva in his mouth while he's eating. Mm. And it's, I don't know why they do it. It's, it's wow. kind of gross. That's but good, I really like the show. Um, I like the, the runny eggs, first of all. So I, See, I, I don't like I runny do. eggs. Oh, yeah. Mm. I've, I've learned to enjoy it sometimes, but i got to really mix it in so it's more like a sauce. To do that, yeah. But I don't like it, especially if I'm just having fried eggs. So the eggs are good, the, um, the, um, the weeds, the the, 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 weeds. <laughs> the weeds, that's what I call them. They look like weeds. They're, they're, they're fresh and, and crispy. The bread, of course, is crunchy. It's, like, it's a toast, uh, so it's really <coughs> crunchy. I didn't taste any any bacon jam, though. I, we need I to have a hunt for bacon jam. Yeah, I'm going to have to probably Let's see. dissect this. Oh, that is just, oh, it's I think, bacon. I think it's, it's bacon. bacon. Now, see if it's, see if it's sweet. Is it sweet? 
<coughs> yeah. <coughs> yeah, it's got a little something in it. Yeah. <coughs> Bacon jam. Bacon jam. Mm. I will have to see <coughs> a, a fun place for us to go if you've never been there. Is have you been to Republic? Mm. They have um, a thing called bacon steak. Bacon steak? What yeah. is that? It's it's bacon steak. I don't know any way to describe it. So it's like, one piece like of bacon. And then when they call it like ham? Nope. Nope. It's, <laughs> I mean, it's I mean. cut from the same area as bacon. It mm -hmm. is bacon, but instead of slicing it super thin and frying it up, it's like a quarter inch thick piece of bacon. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bring us out. We'll, we'll, we'll sample it. Republic, we're coming for you. That's right. All right. So I want to try some of that. Yeah, yeah. You want to swap it out? Swap, swap it. Swap it. Because I love like poke and the, the fish and you, seaweed. Oh. Ow! <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's that too. stab. Sorry, that's totally different. All right. Now I'm going to avoid the bread because I am still mm -hmm. m actively on keto. Mm. But I did get everything else. So I have some of your weeds mm -hmm. and some of the bacon jam, avocado. Oh, it's got a little spice to it. See, I don't get that. Well, I'm a gringo, so I can taste some of the spice. White people. I took my heartburn pill this morning. We're planning ahead now, right? Mm hmm. We're here with Patrick Kilpatrick. Patrick, thanks for coming on the show. Pleasure, Appreciate man. it. This is our local coffee shop. It, yeah. it is. It <laughs> is. Um, so I think a lot of people like to start from the beginning. I'm not one of those people. Uh, you have your own film company. Is that true? I did. Uncommon Dialogue Films started in around 2005. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, we do the full range of things from idea inception to global marketing. Um, whatever is needed. I do a lot of producing consulting. A lot of times I get hired as a lead actor and really the people don't know what they're doing or they're, they're, they're pretty close to making some cataclysmic mistakes. So, I like that, cataclysmic. Well, you don't, you got to help them. Uh, and and they're, they have had a good idea maybe, but they they really, um, they're going to lose everybody's money, they're going to um, fail uh, cinematically if they don't uh, know. It takes a while to put that sort of skill set together. And, Absolutely. And um, not a lot of filmmakers, if they, if they can come out of school and have put together the the basics of, of grand storytelling, they really haven't put together all, all the tremendous things that are necessary for a really good business model. So they're going to, the people, the one, we call them friends and fools who have given mo them money uh, <laughs> initially, they're going to lose it. Right. And, you know, distribution is kind of like on the waterfront. Um, if you don't know what you're doing, You'll bake the cake, and um, somebody else will eat it. So. Don't let somebody eat your cake yeah. or drink your milkshake. No. <laughs> uh, that I mean, it's quite a balancing act these days because uh, distribution has changed a lot. 
Um, and I think I agree with you. A lot of people don't understand uh, the difference between just tr being straight artistic, which mm -hmm. is great. You can you can produce a, a film that's uh, uh, you know beautiful and tells a great story. But if you're not walking that balancing act to something that's actually marketable and you have all those ducks in a row, you you might nobody might ever see it. Yeah, I mean. Uh, a very simple thing, which is key, is, is things need to, in order to be economically viable, they need to be globally attractive. And that's something... Write that down. That's something that I'm, I'm be, trying to be globally attractive myself. But, but, we're all... You know. <laughs> it's maybe a losing battle. Yeah, I know. After, but that's something that has to be considered and calculated from idea inception really you know um, mm -hmm. I was dealing with somebody yesterday that they had a the concept for a project and they, they want to get it done and they've got some funding but the idea is flawed it, it's not going to be globally attractive so it, or maybe they haven't figured out a way to get women into the theater with mm -hmm. the project mm -hmm. so you're cutting off 51 percent of the population so these are things that have to be thought of really in the conceiving of the script um, so uh, there's a lot of stuff it li oh, literally I mean, takes decades and you got to stay on top of it because it, as you said the the whole system is constantly evolving yeah it's an ever shifting uh, market and like even uh, when you get into Netflix and Amazon and you know all those things happening you also have have you seen a shift um, from you know, years ago, the audience was targeted was relatively young, and you know that under fourteen, un to, 25. 14 to twenty five, and now, which I never did really understand because obviously you got to have a job to have money, and and what what's don't don't people who are twenty four to fifty five or sixty or seventy, especially as we're growing older and we're living longer. They have that disposable income too. How do we get all of them to like a project and get in the theater? Yeah, it's called four quadrant um, audience building or whatever. Um, men, women, you know, eight to eighty. Um, you don't want to do that to the point where you subvert your dramatic creation, but you definitely can do that right. because you can't be everything to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. No, you can't. But you know, film and, and television and these things are universally themed, and um, you know, you can't expect a guy really in Mumbai to be really enthralled with maybe, unless it's very skillfully done, uh, maybe a '60s radical bombing that took place in America. Right. So um, you have to tread lightly when you're doing stuff like that. Um, some of the uh, restrictions that international distributors would put on things lack vision, um, but some of their considerations are, are valid and need to be considered. But how many filmmakers do you know go out and talk to in international distributors before they start writing a script? I don't no, know any. They don't. <laughs> no. Yeah, that's, a, that's way after Actually, the fact. In fact, maybe 25, 30 years ago, I did exactly that um, to find out what was motivating them. And they're motivated by genre, budget, and who's in it. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's Matt Damon and a love story, you're not going to get your money. Mm -hmm. If it's Matt Damon, $42 million on an action film, yeah, you're going to get yeah. your money. Unless it's so, the China Wall. <laughs> they got their money. <laughs> they did, they they just, did because yeah. they, it was, that was really produced for, for China. Like, that was about That's another thing. Right? You know, you bring up a, a, a. I was reading an article about Richard Gere the other day. And, um, you know, he hasn't done a studio movie since uh, The Red Corner. Um, right now, a lot of, I think, very weak willed decisions are made because of the consideration of China. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying exclude them, but. He's persona non gratis in China because of the Tibet thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I don't think he's suffering because he gets to do independent films and stuff like that. Right. He's doing what he wants to do. He's doing what he wants to do, but he's being excluded sort of in the way that somebody who has maybe conservative politics would be, cons uh, would be excluded here. Um, very interesting sort of a flip-flop. Yeah. Um, you have to think about these things. Absolutely. I, uh, 
barbershop. That's why I don't do a lot of business with Chinese. <laughs> well, I mean, it's interesting. I feel like, you know, well, you're it's also... Well, repressive authoritarian country, Yeah, yeah. And they're... We, well, you can't be against it and for the money. Yeah, it's I mean, like I've a, had people, you know... A moral stand somewhere. The money was, uh, okay, you're going to help us obliterate Taiwan. You know, so, come on. Right. I mean, you know. Well, I don't really want to do that. No, we don't want to do that. No. <laughs> Now you have been really in probably ever every major cop drama show that's been out for a few years. Uh, NCIS, yeah. 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 CSI. Yes, all of them. <laughs> all of them. All of them. <laughs> CSI. NCIS. Yeah. Uh, and Criminal Minds. Yeah. Which was I told you one of my particular favorite one. characters yeah. that you've done recently. He's a good character. He's dark. That's really fun. dark. And based uh, on a real person. Yeah. Really. Yeah, and that was a guy called the Iceman. Uh, there's a great documentary called The Iceman and the Psychology. And the also a movie, yes? Yeah, they've done a couple things. Yeah, yeah. Right? But the documentary, they sent a... Uh, uh, that guy had killed like 250 people. And he had killed maybe 150 people before the mob got a hold of him. Wow. Just, him just for shits a, and giggles. A, a contract killer. Hmm. And uh, he got caught and... He, they had him in Trenton Maximum Security Prison, and they sent a world-renowned psychiatrist in there over a series of shows to talk to him. Really fascinating. Hmm. And uh, they had me watch that before I did Criminal Minds because, you know, the thing is, we think of the people of consummate evil or whatever as being different than us. But they're not really in their manner. I mean, you could be a serial killer right now. You could and we're just having a conversation. And that's really what it comes down to. This guy would blush it, 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 when the psychiatrist would say something that you know he would kill him if he had said that outside. He got like a mild blush. That's the only thing that was in it. And you could see he had a little thing that he did with his lips. So I wasn't channeling that guy, but it was really, really fascinating to watch it. And Mandy Potemkin, a very smart guy, said, uh, it's just a conversation. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, it is. I mean, evil is... Sometimes, you know, if you're doing a B-movie, it's it's cinematic and you're eating the scenery and, you know, you're doing uh, the comic book hero villain or something. But real, true evil and finality or serial killers, they're, they're also they're often the personification of banality. Um, they just don't have that thing that, that differentiates that that's a wrong. Is <laughs> that right from wrong? Well, well, what was interesting about that guy is um, at the end, uh, the Iceman said to the psychiatrist, what do you think of me? Because hmm. mostly it was the psychiatrist asking him questions, but at the end, and the psychiatrist spoke very eloquently for about 12 minutes about when you were born because of the abuse of your mother and your father, you develop some very unique qualities. Uh, uh, first of all, you have a fearlessness, which is a great thing if you're a fighter pilot or a fireman or something like that, but absolute no fear. And he also said, you, because of the abuse, you developed, a, and I may be getting the terms wrong, mm -hmm. but something like a uh, paranoid, paranoid psychotic disorder, and antisocial behavior. And the triumvirate of those three things caused the guy to be the perfect killing machine. Um, wow. <laughs> it, it was very interesting Crazy. To, to, to listen to that. Wow. And it's portray so, that, it's, that character. And yeah, I mean, it, it, it kind of, in a certain way, makes it simpler because mm -hmm. you're just having a conversation and you want to get that blush when Mm -hmm. they, they hit a trigger point. You feel like that was an excitement blush, or I wish I could do something about this blush? It was like an internal fury. He of, just of the most could intense only came up to that. You know, interesting. I mean, this guy had about around the, yeah. around the age of 18 had decided, uh, I'm not going to ever let anybody disrespect me again because of the abuse mm -hmm. he had. The problem was, he would be in the coffee shop here and if somebody stepped in front of him to go to the men's room he viewed that as as an existential uh, insult 
So he'd follow them out into the car park and strangle them. Oh my. Uh, he'd get in ro road rage and execute four or five people. Uh, wow, that'd be like every day down here in LA. <laughs> this is like every, every minute. He'd be killing somebody down here. This place um, is nuts. <laughs> his, his parameters of disrespect were, were pretty wide. I think that's crazy. It's interesting how different projects lead you down different paths and introduce you to things that maybe if you weren't an actor or you weren't an entertainer, you might never go down those particular rabbit holes. I just uh, I just played a pedophilic priest in a movie called. Venetian. That's not easy to say, by the way. <laughs> yeah. very, very interesting, called Catalyst. Hmm. Um, and the director Chris Vulcan basically built a, a pretty elaborate structure, but we had to improv it through these beats. Uh, there was no script. There was an 18-page sort of um, structure, mm -hmm. and. Um, just hitting the points that he wanted to get across. And so I did a lot of research, and again, the research is not playing the thing, but just like you can do all the research on serial killers you want, but then you have to make it a live creature. But um, the information about the, the pedophilic priest and pedophilia in general was really fascinating. I mean, a lot of it seems to be somewhat of a lost childhood on their own. They're kind of, in a certain sense, looking for a playmate. Interesting. It was really helpful to um, to read all of that. And uh, which actually refers back, the Iceman's brother was a pedophile. And the Iceman considered him the grand sinner. Whereas what he had done, killing 250 people, was yeah. justified. He had no problem. It was very interesting. Different minds, different yeah. thoughts, right? So, That's crazy. You know, and when you're acting, we had seven actors. Um, it's like dramatic improv. That's yeah. We were having. I do a lot of that because you know a lot of these scripts are not uh, Citizen Kane. We've <laughs> <laughs> been there. So um, yeah. The great thing about that is they'll hire me to be a a, a jerk thug. Uh -huh. And because I have a vocabulary and education, they actually get a, a brilliant criminal. <laughs> so yeah, the they're mind. always happy to do that. Yeah, but they, it's a much more interesting character yeah, than, just, not than just a brute. That they expected to get. So um, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's a really interesting thing. I mean, I, I seem to be in my. I played a pastor. Uh, a Baptist pastor, and now, now this pedophilic priest, and what I was going to say was they had seven guys all representing the seven deadly sins, and clearly the pedophile was the one who got the most revulsion and sure. the most reviling uh, of the thing the whole time hmm. I was doing that. You, you've got uh, leaves falling on us. Yeah, be careful. There's we're in the nature. We're, got, oh, <laughs> got little, nature on me. These little, little seed things fall on us too. Now you've 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 done films with just about every action superstar out there. Do you like action? Uh, never, uh, well, the natural, I, I was a physical guy, an athlete before. That's because you're so you know you're little. You hardly have any book at all to you. That's right. So they, um, <laughs> no. It's like, what are you, they six were two? always <laughs> doing that. Often I was uh, choreographing the stunts while I was doing it and stuff. So, you know, the universe finds where you go and you put your energy out and that's where you're... I have, uh, that's been a really interesting journey because hmm. there are all different kinds of leading men and leading ladies out there. I joke and say I've been killed by all of them on Earth and in outer space. But, <laughs> yeah, um, I know. <laughs> uh, Many of them you wouldn't have even heard of because they maybe they're a big star in Canada or Asia or right. something like that. Um, but yeah, you have to read my book. I've got a book coming out called Dying for Living. Dying uh, for Living? When's that come out? Ooh. Well, I'm very fortunate. Uh, I have this brilliant uh, uh, literary manager, a guy named Murray Weiss, who is in New York. And he's with a group called Intellectual Property Group. And they jumped on the book immediately when I called them up and talked to them about it. They read the draft. 
which I had taken a year to do. And the process is very, very interesting. People don't probably, what you do, they do is they make, take select chapters, maybe no more than four, and that becomes your calling card to the publishers that they, they submit to. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And you also have a very elaborate- it's like your elevator speech for a book. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Here's Patrick, this is his writing style, this is what the book is going to encompass. Maybe you got chapter 1, 2, and then chapter 30 and 33, mm -hmm. or something like that to show where the book goes. And you have this elaborate document called the chapter head outline, which mm -hmm. says everything that you're going to have in each chapter, which is pretty difficult since you haven't written a lot of those chapters. Okay? Right. So we did that mostly the second year, and then he originally had had me take out the politics, but then with Trump being elected, they wanted me to put the politics back. So that's what we're <laughs> doing right now. And, well, uh, that adds controversy for sure. Yeah, I mean, the world has really changed in six months. Yeah. It is mm -hmm. really, um, and it adds controversy, and it, I, I am a little bit, certainly an endangered species or a unique creature here for a lot of things um, <laughs> uh, and have been for a couple decades. So I think the thrust is, here's a, a patriotic freak who's actually thriving uh, in a very, very liberal enclave. And uh, to some extent that's true. Um, I'm far less right-wing than you might get credit for because I think we live in such liberal orthodoxy in Hollywood that let's say you're pro Second Amendment, that immediately puts you in the maniac side. Uh, <laughs> you know, which, uh, I mean, think of how reviled Charlton Heston was mm. in the latter, latter day of his life. I mean, as a guy who walked with King during the Civil Rights Movement right, right, because right. of his Second Amendment uh, stance. So it's it's very easy to fall into that. I don't really care because uh, I sort of speak my mind, and it's kind of, for me. It's really, uh, and I don't mean to sound pompous or anything, but it's it's. I think it's more important to be a good American citizen and person of the world than it is really after a while to be an actor. Um, oh, it, hmm. absolutely. So, uh, and it seems not to have or any. Independent world, it doesn't seem to hurt. Perhaps in the institutional television world, mm -hmm. uh, it may have some limiting things. And, but it's very hard to gauge negative effect. Um, if they're not going to give you a job because of your political views, they don't call you up and say, "Hey, I'm not, Patrick, we're not, we're not doing this because of this." this one. They're just like, you, "You just don't get the call." Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, but I benefited so much by drawing people who have similar uh, beliefs to me that, um, you know, my dad was a World War II war hero. He mm. got all kinds of medals at Okinawa. And so I came to Hollywood a very patriotic person in, in the traditional sense. And this is a very, very different place. And I address a lot of that in the book. I like that. Well, I think that it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, you're limiting yourself if you only can see things in one place. Like I have a lot of friends that are like, oh, this person has different views to me. I, I they're off my Facebook list. Delete. Uh, we're not friends anymore. Well, that's crazy. I'm like, I, but I but but now you can't. Yeah. But now you don't know what the world is. No. And if you only have friends that are in this narrow strip, I want to have friends that can have a difference in opinion and 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 be around people that yeah. might enlighten me somehow. But if I only I don't have this narrow group of, of course, people. Of them don't this is it. This is all I'm ever going to know. Have an intelligent conversation about their differences. Well, that's the problem. That's, <laughs> that's, that's a you can't solve disease a in problem itself. without listening to other people. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I, I wrote a paper on the immigration situation for, and I sent it to the, all the senators and stuff. Got zero response from many of them. But what's interesting is <laughs> from both parties. Nothing like this paper has come out, and I, I looked at it from talking to a multitude of people mm -hmm. how to solve this challenge that we have. But I didn't come up with that myself. I came up with that by listening to maybe 20 different people from 20 different sectors and applying what I call solution methodology to it. 
<laughs> There's not a lot of that going on right now. We have, we're, we're so uh, polarized that... Um, no, I mean, and listen, I have some good friends who are raving, raving liberals. Um, but we can talk about it, and, 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 and I think they have some respect for my views and their views, and we reach a consensus. We, but being a person who reaches a consensus now makes you the antichrist on both sides. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is. I, I agree I, to disagree. I just don't really love <laughs> all those extremes and that, the lack of ability to, to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. I, is befuddling to me, mm -hmm. which has all come out of the woodwork really in the last year. You These remember people, the movie Traffic? I do. Yeah. Oh, it yeah. covered the drug thing from a lot of it. The immigration thing mm -hmm. is a as vast a scope situation, and a, and the solution of a problem has to solve both issues on both sides, uh, and also the, the positive, what's apparent and what's underneath. You know, we have a, a situation where Republicans want the cheap labor. And Democrats want uh, the votes, um, so uh, that's the underneath. Mm -hmm. the, the above, um, the Republicans want punitive action against uh, illegals, uh, and the Democrats want amnesty. So you've got to figure out a way to listen to those both sides and actually solve both sides with peripheral benefits to the nation, which I call solution methodology, but not a lot of people do that. Mm -hmm. Certainly our government doesn't. Oh, no. So, so when are you running for office? Are you gonna be a, <laughs> we got another actor here that's going running for office, ran folks. I Congress for three weeks. Oh, did you? Uh, All three weeks. Well, you know, it, we at one time, I, I learned a couple of things. You have <laughs> to start at least two years in advance yeah. and it was a very unless you're the rock you I know guess. Henry Waxman Jump was right retiring in. so he announced and I said great I'm gonna run so um, fant fantastic things happen because if you're an actor a l every journalist wants to talk so you get a lot mm. of press yeah but you also have to get a certain number of signatures mm -hmm. And the 33rd district has been so gerrymandered and messed about that nobody knows where they live. <laughs> so you actually have to take a computer program uh, and a laptop out with you and vet every person who signs your thing. So on like three different occasions, I had about 80% of my signatures that would get um, kicked. The kick, and you'd have 24 hours to come up with the rest. So wow. wow. So there's that, and also it takes, you know, I think it's a disease that people think they can make movies without money. Hmm. I think it's also a disease that people think they can run for office without money. Yeah. You yeah. can't. We can't do it. And the other thing is, I was doing two films at the time, and mm -hmm. the workload, if you run for something like that. I mean, I was happy when I got bounced out because I was going to die. That's how yeah. intense the deal is. So if I ever was to do that again, I would clear the decks for at least two years prior to the thing. Um, it's the only way to approach it. It's a big commitment. By the mm -hmm. way, California is a very, you know, there's seven to one Democrats mm -hmm. and Republicans here. So you take a place like L.A., you're like running way uphill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, are, you take yeah, you somebody are. like Arnold with millions and millions of dollars and also a wife who's the quintessential right. Democrat yeah. to to pull that down. Yeah. Um, but it's, as Trump, it's a great book tour. It, if you want to do that, that, that wasn't why I was doing no. it. I just... Um, First of all, my book wasn't ready. But <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I wouldn't have, but yeah. yeah. Is is your book uh, available yet? Or you said you're still in the process of. No, I'm right now. Your... I just delivered the draft with the Politics Institute, and I'm sure uh, I have a really <laughs> wonderful relationship with this man, Murray Weiss, and he's he's about eighty percent of the time brilliant. The other time, he says stuff that I don't agree with, so I have to figure out how to meet his needs at the same time not lose something hmm. essential within the book so um well when it does let us know no, we'll, we'll, put, we'll come back. put it on the show yeah, yeah. that'd be that'd be fantastic <clears throat> what uh a movie that you you're nothing that you've been in uh what's what's something that you're have been excited about 
in the last year or so. Um, well, I'm really excited about the la last three movies that are about to come out because the leading man wasn't capable of learning their lines. Hmm. They also weren't capable of using cue cards. So they also weren't capable of, of repeating phrases that the director would say off camera. So. Um, See, there's still hope for both of us. I know. I say we're we're, 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 I can do all this we're available. I can memorize a little well, bit. And, uh, <laughs> at least the reality is they're still very. I shouldn't name names, uh, except I do in my book. But you um, get the book. You, you see, now you got to go get the book. Get the book. Yes, right. You you have to. Uh, you, first of all, in that kind of environment, I come across as like Brando, because yeah. I learn my lines and really work. And mm -hmm. these guys are. So lacking in self-discipline, so they're either drug-addled or... Uh, I'm just regular addled. Addled. Right. Um, you know, so, and, and for a variety of reasons, you know, if you do a movie with a, a former light heavyweight champion of UFC, their short-term memory is gone. Does hmm. his last name start with a C? No. No? no. <laughs> but he was able to repeat okay. the phrases from the director. Of At least, yeah. Then you have another actor who's working so much that he literally doesn't have time to learn the lines. Yeah, because there's so many projects going at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, so that's a different reason. You can kind yeah, of some actors that. that that's a method. I know that uh, my my acting coach talks about that. That there are some people that that they want to know it like just barely before they walk on, and so that they get that what, I sincere think it's response. A slope. I, I mean, it, really it seems like it to me. Now, some I, people I, don't I, believe in off yeah. book. Uh, memorizing your lines completely because it loses some. For some people, mm -hmm. it becomes stoic and. I, I have flat. to work at it. Well, I mean, you have to work on that. Uh, yeah. I teach a lot of acting. I t I've taught at a lot of universities, and I do a lot of private coaching here. And I get really full on mentoring with young people and stuff. When I've auditioned actors and they've come in and they've had three days to prepare and they don't know the three lines they have to say. <laughs> I go, you're not going to get this job. No. You know, yeah. it's like you go to an audition and a guy's going. I mean, those people aren't booking the work. I mean, I, 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 the, my students are off book. You know, yeah. the reality is you get material at 8 or 9 o'clock at night. Yeah. And you got to be performance ready the next day at 10. And they're, what I teach them is how to do that swiftly and brilliantly uh, so that you're going to book the work. Isn't it interesting that people come to, Among they come other. into this business and they don't treat it like a business. I'm going to come because I'm pretty, I'm going to come because I think I'm talented and I'm just going to swoop in here and get work and then they're gone in six, eight months because they're not booking anything. It worked. But it's, it's I, I'm like amazed by that concept. You wouldn't go, I, hey, I'm going to apply for this job at IBM and I don't know anything about anything well, and I'm just going to walk in and get yeah. a management position. Would you use a heart surgeon who didn't go to med school? Absolutely Some of these people not. are like, and they haven't confused. Uh, somehow there's a confusion if they even know who somebody like Kate Blanchett is. Uh, it's confused with a host on, um, uh, you know, Entertainment Tonight. They, they've got hosting somewhere in there, which has really nothing to do with transformational acting. Right. So, like our show, The Bruce Brothers. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Well, the, tr the truth is, I was very lucky. I had somebody who could show me where excellence lies. Most people don't know where excellence lies, and unless they go to some place like Yale School of Drama or Juilliard or or some other really fine schools, then they don't know where excellence lies. Um, the other thing is, most schools don't teach really, really rigorous audition. Um, you know, they teach scene study. Which is a great skill set, but it's not auditioning. Right. And if you don't master auditioning, you're not going to work. And you're not yeah. going to learn and get better on the sets. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a lot of things, you know. Yeah, scene study is good, but if you don't get the job, you don't have nothing to work on, you know? Well, I mean, you know, supposedly Robert De Niro was a terrible audition. Mm -hmm. But Robert De Niro ran into Martin Scorsese. Mm -hmm. uh, I tend to think he would have surfaced no matter what. Right. But he was by all accounts 
the, the worst auditioner ever because he was nervous and withdrawn and everything else. Um, so, uh, so it's who you know. <laughs> that well, makes I mean, it I think that you advice. know, obviously, Somebody sometimes you do get some. You have to the luck does yeah. you know come into play. But if you got luck and skill, then there you are. Yeah, I feel like if you really, you know, everybody goes, how do I get an agent? How do I get into the union? How do I do all this? You have one job. If you're a brilliant actor, all that stuff is going to take care of itself. Right. So mm -hmm. become a brilliant actor. Become a brilliant writer. Become whatever. That other stuff is going to fall into place. The mm -hmm. universe is going to align with you. Um, but they don't get that. Yeah. Oh, how do I develop my brand? I mean, just keep on. doing stuff and it'll come right, it'll happen, you know? Be Tom Hardy and you won't have to worry. <clears throat> yeah. You know, be that skillful at, at transformational acting. So. His career goes so much farther back than most people know, too. Like when you when you start looking at his body work, mm -hmm. he, he doesn't. Oh, a lot of people are like overnight stunning. success, not overnight success. Yeah. yeah. Ever. 10, 15 years <laughs> worth of. Not a thing. <laughs> well, not very I mean, if you look at a guy like Jean Claude Van Damme, he probably did 10 movies before he even had one that hit with Bloodsport. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you're talking about a person who had a tremendous storytelling work ethic right up to that time. Uh, He's got something out now, right? Uh, is there a new Blackwater? Blackwater, and I'm I'm in it. Uh, ah. Yeah, I did. Uh, after 28 <laughs> years, I did another movie with him. Wow! So, uh, and he's got a show on. I want to say he's got a show on Netflix coming out too. I didn't have to do too. any fighting in this. Gratefully, I don't have to do as much of that as I. That's do. good. <laughs> um, uh, well, you're sort of known for doing your own stunts as well, aren't you? Yeah, but you get a little older, you get to be the general rather than the guy, or you get to be the mob boss instead of the person who's hmm. doing all of that. I, I, I certainly can do it, but um, I like stunts, particularly if it's something I haven't done. It gets really old just to do fighting. Yeah. You know, and for, there was probably 15, 20 years there that I had to do all my own fighting. And, and uh, you get banged up and... Hmm. Uh, it's just not new. But whereas jumping through a glass window with two pistols, that they explode the window just yeah. to hit, that's fun. Yeah, you I imagine. <laughs> and it, it's changed a lot. Oh, okay. I got to wrap here pretty soon. Uh, it's changed a lot too. Uh, this is my wife. Uh, this is. It's changed a lot too with uh, like the Bourne series and the pace of fight scenes. Oh, I want to see Atomic Blonde. That's going to. Oh, absolutely. Although, do you think it would have been a better title, Atomic Blondie? Thomas Blondie. <laughs> I'm gonna leave that one alone. <laughs> well, we can probably we, talk to you for like hours. You got some great stuff. Yeah, we, like we, I think we're gonna have to. We have to have you back. Person at a bus stop. I think we're gonna have to have you back when the book comes out. Anytime. Thank you for, for coming sure. out. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. You it's betcha. Always good to have a cashew lot. If you like the show, it. watch it on YouTube or Facebook. Give us a like and comment. Give us a thumbs up. And if you give us a thumbs down, oh. We know where you live. I should say <laughs> yeah. I've got uh, Cops and Robbers coming out. Uh, um, American Violence is in the store right now. Um, uh, Borstal was number one in London. Uh, we shot that in London. Mm -hmm. And Catalyst is coming out and Beyond the Shield. So, he's got a lot of stuff coming out. You gotta watch it. He's, he's really just gotta pick up the pace a little bit. He's kind of slow. <laughs> <down. laughs> he's like, he's <laughs> Thank you a again. Bit. See you soon. We'll see everybody Thank later. You very much. Thanks, y'all. Bye bye. Bye.